fun research program. Uh, so each of our collaborators have provided critical resources and expertise for sample collection, processing, and analysis. So PER and polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances are PFAS, um, are classic chemicals defined by a chain of carbon atoms bonded to fluorine. Now, the strong bond between the carbon and fluorine atoms make PFAS extremely stable and resistant to breaking down by biological mechanisms, heating, or chemical transformation. Now, this has earned them designation forever. Uh, PFAS chemicals differ by the length of their carbon backbone and functional groups at the end, such as that carboxylic acid or the um, sulfate, ammonium, or hydroxide. And then they can be decorated with other atoms, such as in Gen X with that ether oxygen. Um, so most of the research done to date has been on those two prototypic chemicals, PFOA and PFOS. Um, and because of their persistence, toxicity, and adverse health effects, manufacturers participating in the 2010-2015 PFOA stewardship program report that they no longer produce PFOA and PFOS in the U.S., although exemptions permitting use and manufacturing do still exist. But more and more awareness of these chemicals is building as a class. Uh, these first six were required for federal monitoring under EPA's UCMR3 program from 2013 to 2015. Um, and the most recent comprehensive analysis from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, identified uh, 4,730 different PFAS-related CAS registry numbers including 947 that were registered in the EPA Toxic Substance Control Act, or TSCA, chemical inventory. And of those 947 TSCA registered PFAS, 602 are reported commercially active. So PFAS are used for a variety of industrial applications and in consumer products. And through their widespread use, there's potential for widespread exposure. Um, Locally, we're familiar with exposure through drinking water, but we're finding that other consumable products might also contribute to overall exposure. Uh, due to their desirable chemical properties, PFAS are components of aqueous film forming foams, or AFFFs, heat resistant lubricants, nonstick coatings, and water and oil repellents. And they're used as precursors and additives in fluoropolymers and plastics. So if you see the words, um, stain resistant, water resistant, grease res resistant, nonstick. Um, good chance that that convenience can be attributed to PFAS. The same physical properties that makes these chemicals desirable for industrial applications, such as that longevity and heat stability, also contribute to their persistence in the environment. And new studies are indicating that even through heavy fish consumption, we may be adding to our overall body burden. So since initial productions in the 1950s, PFAS have become a pervasive worldwide contaminant. Um, much of the exploration has been clustered around known sites of contaminants downstream of manufacturing processes or around military sites. So while this uh, map from EWG is uh, extremely helpful and currently um, comprehensive about the current knowledge, this is likely an underestimate of true national PFAS contamination. Uh, the National Health and Nutritional Education Survey, or NHANES, reports detecting PFOS and PFOA in the blood of about 95% of Americans. Despite this pervasive contamination and large number of different PFAS, there's, um, only extensive, or there's only extensive health and exposure related data for two of our prototypic PFAS, that PFOS and PFOA. But a growing number of studies are evaluating the impacts of replacements for each of them. So Gen X is the replacement for PFOA and PFBS as the replacement for PFOS. The toxicity assessment is limited. Um, and most of what we do know is from the C8 study done in West Virginia um, that noted effects such as decreases in liver and kidney function, increases in cholesterol levels, changes in uh, immune response, thyroid disease, um, harm on development and uh, reproduction, as well as carcinogenic effects. So PFAS have truly emerged as a public and environmental health problem. <clears throat> Therefore, once the news broke in Wilmington in 2017 that an upstream manufacturer was discharging contaminants into the Cape Fear River, 
and that those contaminants were not removed by currently operating water treatment processes. Uh, we started cataloging the known knowns, the known unknowns, and preparing for the unknown unknowns. Um, there were several public meetings held in Wilmington where we tried to communicate and translate um, the depth of the knowledge about what PFAS were and what exposure from them might mean for human health. Um, so Dr. Jane Hoppins group at the North Carolina State University Center for Human Health and the Environment began a human exposure study for the city of Wilmington to de determine if PFAS could be detected in the human body of an exposed population. Um, and then in addition to the questions that we got about personal health and safety, a lot of the residents' questions also included uh, about environmental impacts to the Cape Fear River, the animals that lived in it, um, and how possibly consuming those fish from the river might contribute to their overall exposure. So um, this community-driven research really kicked off our major questions. Um, we wanted to see if we could detect PFAS in wildlife, um, if we could use wildlife studies as an insight into the fate of different PFAS, and if exposure to uh, those PFAS could be associated with impacts to wildlife health. These are our uh, broad study goals. So we wanted to see if we could characterize or monitor levels of PFAS in the blood, tissue, and water of wildlife. So we started with the American alligator, striped bass, and other commonly consumed fish. Within there, we wanted to measure their overall exposure, see if we could categorize or characterize bioaccumulation, bioconcentration, and biomagnification, which I'll define for you here in just a second look for any impacts on health. And because this has been a community-driven research project, we wanna make sure that we're communicating our findings to our stakeholders. Um, so I encourage you to check out our brand new, still work in progress website, safewaternc.org. This will be another fun project for us to be working on while we are uh, working from home here. So uh, for what I mean by bioaccumulation, bioconcentration, and biomagnification, or at least how we're going to be using them here to determine if we're actually seeing them. So for bioaccumulation, we measure this as an increase of concentration of the chemical in an organism over time relative to the chemical's concentration in the environment. This can happen during um, or through different exposures through air, water, food and soil. Um, but basically, if we see more chemical in the body of an animal compared to the water, surrounding water, then bioaccumulation is occurring. Bioconcentration is about direct accumulation of a contaminant from the organism's surroundings, um, such as through the air via the lungs or water or sediment via the gills or integument or the skin. And in, typically, this doesn't considered dietary pathways, so just direct from the exposure, not through what it's eating. Um, we're also using this to differentiate as an increased concentration of a contaminant over time as a function of age or size. For biomagnification, this is a process by which concentration of a contaminant increases in the tissues of organisms as a function of their trophic position. Oh, um, as a definition, this requires at least three trophic levels to be able to say that this is actually happening. Um, so for us, we're taking a top-down approach, beginning with our apex predator, the American alligator. Eventually, we'll work down to be able to capture at least three trophic levels. So we're gonna start talking today about um, our charismatic megafauna. I'll, we'll look at the levels that we've detected in American alligators. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could identify a reference population for comparison to see what background might be, since we do know that there's pervasive contamination around the nation. Um, we'll look at exposure and the impacts to health that we're seeing in this apex predator. So using American alligators uh, is actually really useful, uh, especially um, as a sentinel species because they can act as early warning signs that are impacting humans. Alligators are a long-lived species, you know, can be up to 40 or 50 years. Um, they, and they're really our canary in the coal mine because they have really robust immune systems. So if we do see impacts to the health of American alligators, there's a good chance that we could be seeing impacts to humans. 
They're also a great model for local contamination because they're home bodies. We really um, don't see alligators moving much more than five miles outside of their range. So one of the first questions that we usually get when we say that we're working with alligators is how do you do that? So we use, a, once we've located the animal, a lot of this has been thanks to a community input of where they might be um, living. We use a fishing pole with a weighted hook on the end of it and a barbless treble hook to actively capture the animal, um, bring uh, the hook across the body, and then bring it to shore. And once we do that, we snare it with a, uh, like a dog catching pole, get control of the mouth and the jaws. Right? Luckily, all of their force goes down, so as long as we get that closed up, then they're pretty well under control after that. We take a quick blood sample, the very first thing that we do, and then some body measurements of the total body, head, and tail. After that, we mark it so that if it's recaptured either by our team members or Wildlife Resources Commission, we can track it. And then it's a straight release back into where we grabbed it from. Our average time from capture to release is about uh, 14 minutes for all of our captures. And we take a little bit longer for the, the bigger animals. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, up to I average about 40 minutes um, if the animal is larger than 11 feet, but that's just to, to really make sure that we're being safe and sometimes they can put up a little bit more of a, a struggle in that active capture. So once we've collected that blood sample, uh, we um, extract PFAS from it and quantify it using mass spectrometry. And we also do hematology and blood chemistry to look for associations between PFAS levels in this blood and serum with uh, adverse health effects or biomarkers of adverse health effects. So this is our um, study uh, captures to date. And we have samples from about 85 animals uh, from Lake Waccamaw, Wilmington, and then uh, throughout the Cape Fear River Basin. We've captured males and females, everything from um, hatchlings, you know, week old hatchlings, to uh, the largest in our city is just shy of about 12 feet. Um, and it's really important for us to be able to identify this reference population because we're not dosing animals. This is uh, purely a uh, observational study. So we use the Lumber River Basin as our potential reference because it doesn't have any known contamination of PFAS. Um, as the crow flies, Lake Waccamaw in the upper left-hand corner is about 40 miles from the known source of contamination for the Cape Fear and Greenfield Lakes about 66 miles. Um, and there's only about 30 miles between our two uh, clustered sites, but the lakes are separated by that basin boundary between the Lumber and the Cape Fear. Um, so spatially, we can describe our Southeast American alligators as dispersed with these, these two local clusters. Uh, so most of the comparisons that we're going to be making are from uh, those, our reference site at Lake Waccamaw and that cluster, and then our cluster in Wilmington around Greenfield Lake. This is a summary of the um, exposure of these two populations. Uh, so if you'll notice on that axis, this is actually in a log scale. So we're going from 10 to 100 to 1,000 nanograms per milliliter of total PFAS concentration in the serum of these alligators. We do have a significant increase between our two sites. So our geometric mean at Waccamaw is about nine milligrams per milliliter per part per billion, and we're about five times higher with Cape Fear River associated alligators at about 44 nanograms per mil. So we're also observing a number of physiological differences in adult American alligators between these sites. And this is from the uh, plasma chemistry and that blood panel that we do on them. So we do see altered liver enzymes at our exposed site compared to the reference, as well as elevated glucose and plasma osmolarity. That could be an indication of renal damage. So also associated with the higher PFAS levels and those compounds related to manufacturing are unhealed lesions and poor body condition. This is strange for alligators. Their immune systems are so robust that they can commonly heal from amputations of limbs or tails. 
Um, for example, this is Stumpy from Lake Waccamaw. He actually had two missing limbs, one front left foot. And you can see that back rear leg is also missing. That's actually healed over quite nicely. Um, so this is typical of alligators. So having the presence of these unhealed lesions is very weird for them. We also identified the, or the percentage of white blood cells within adult alligators. When we look at that uh, red blood smear, we can identify different cell types. So the, those round gray ones with the blue blotch in the middle, those are their red blood cells. They actually have nucleated red blood cells as opposed to the anucleated red blood cells of humans. Um, or we can count different white blood cells, such as the, uh, the pink one, it's our uh, eosinophils. Um, and then we can identify um, or examine the percentage of each to the total cell count. So what we do see is evidence of increased immune stress through thrombocytopenia. So that is the decrease in thrombocytes at our Wilmington site. So um, basically their platelet counts are low. And lymphocytosis in adult American alligators, so an increase in lymphocytes, the white blood cells, in our exposed population. Um, we also see um, the, oops, the presence of helmet cells um, the, or schist sites. So we're following up on all of these immune cell differences combined with the blood chemistry results um, to evaluate the role of exposure. But we um, are seeing, looks like differences in liver function, renal function, and impacts to the immune system in these alligators. So then moving on to our striped bass, again, wanting to identify a reference population for comparison. Through this, we can uh, evaluate exposure, bioaccumulation, bioconcentration, as well as the impacts on the health. So, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a breakdown of a publication that we really or recently put out I think just last month in Environment International. I've got two ways that you can check this out. You can get to it quickly. Uh, through that tinyurl.com slash striped bass PFAS. Or if you've got your phone handy on your screen, you can take a picture of that QR code and it'll take it, take it to that paper too. I encourage you to check it out and let us know if you have any questions. <laughs> so striped bass is uh, one of the most popular fishes in uh, North America on the Atlantic coast. And its importance has a long history dated back to the colonial times, right? So the commercial and recreational fishery is valued at about $94 million annually. It's about 37 federal dollars for the state of North Carolina to stock a single striped bass into the river. The striped bass is a urihaline fish that ranges from the St. Lawrence River in Canada all the way down to the St. John's River in Florida with a subpopulation located in the Gulf of Mexico. Those two populations don't necessarily mix. Um, and the striped bass are considered to be anadromous, migratory, so they can live in both fresh and salt water. And portions of their life history include time in the ocean and then moving upriver to spawn. So juveniles then typically remain in the estuaries and then migrate into the ocean, but some populations include their entire life cycle without any kind of marine migration. Our Cape Fear population don't migrate, so they do stay in the estuary. They're not contributing to uh, northern genetic mixing. There is no natural reproduction in the Cape Fear River. 100% uh, of the fish that we do catch here are hatchery progeny, um, though they are genetically similar to the Roanoke River after being stocked from the Roanoke about 40 years ago. So nationally, overfishing contributed to the collapse of the striped bass fishery in the 1980s. Oh, that star is where we introduced hybrid striped bass into the Atlantic population. Um, so the wild striped bass stocks in the Atlantic are currently managed by the Eastern Coastal States, following a plan set by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, but according to NOAA, we are still looking at populations significantly below our target level. Here locally, um, our North Carolina striped bass are found in four coastal rivers, right? So the Cape Fear, Noose, Tar, and Roanoke River. The populations in the Tar, Noose, and Cape Fear are all considered stocks of concern by the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries. This is due to a couple of different reasons. So low abundance, just low numbers that we don't have enough to, data to be able to use in stock assessments. 
truncated size and age distributions that we don't have a whole lot of large or old fish. Striped bass can live up to 40 years. We really don't see many uh, older than maybe eight or nine. They're again dominated by hatchery progeny, so there's not a lot of natural reproduction. Most of the fish that we have are contributed by the hatcheries. Um, and then we, as a note, have variable estuary and salinities moving from south to north with the Cape Fear system being the highest salinity and the Roanoke being the lowest. Um, this is just a function of the sounds keeping uh, salt water from pushing up primarily, though there, there are a couple of other contributors there. Our Roanoke River striped bass are the only ones that um, are still doing pretty well. They don't have a high hatchery contribution and they're the freshest of our systems. Also here locally, of course, Hurricane Florence did a number on our striped bass fishery. So I've been encouraged in the last couple of days to be hearing some, some good news from our anglers that they are catching some pre-Florence stripers out there. Uh, but right now the population is dominated by uh, fish that were stocked post Hurricane Florence. So what we did for this study in May of 2018 was go out with the Wildlife Resources Commission and sample striped bass from the Cape Fear River at Lock and Dam 1 by electrofishing. We collected blood and serum from those fish. All the fish that we caught were between two and seven years old, which means that they've been residents of this system for one to six years. So they were um, like they spawned in the hatchery and then stocked into the Cape Fear River. And then we compared their exposure to an aquaculture facility on the Pamlico Tar River, um, just to see if we could detect any differences in their exposure to somewhere that was not the Cape Fear. So this is the frequency of detection of different PFAS in striped bass serum, so in the blood. Uh, so we had 58 fish from the Cape Fear and 29 fish from PAPL, or our reference aquaculture facility. PFAS were detected in 100% of the samples. We looked for uh, PFOS, PFNA, and PFDA were detected in all of our striped bass. Nafion byproduct 2 was only detected in the Cape Fear. We got that in 78% of our samples. Gen X and PFH excess are enriched in the Cape Fear. So while they are present in the PAFL samples, we had 100% of our fish from the Cape Fear had PFH excess, well, um, only 3% of our PAFL fish had them. And then for Gen X, about half of our fish from the Cape Fear, 48%, uh, had it present, well, 10% of our PAFL fish had Gen X in their system. And then we only found PFBS in our reference population, but not in the Cape Fear strike bass. We look at how much was there. Um, our total PFAS concentration in the serum of the Cape Fear fish is about 550 nanograms per milliliter or part per billion. This is the highest concentration of PFAS found in a North American fish to date. If we compare that to our reference sample, we're about 40 times higher in the Cape Fear. So the blood or the PFAS that we found in the serum of our reference population is really what we would consider to be background due to this ubiquitous contamination. And then most of the PFAS that we found in the serum of the striped bass is PFOS. So about 90% is that legacy PFOS for both our Cape Fear fish and our reference population. Like I mentioned, Gen X was detected in about half of the samples and Nafion product by product two at about 80%. Gen X at about a 1.9 part per billion in the blood or serum and then 0.3 part per billion of Nafion byproduct too. Now these are both associated with that manufacturing process on the Cape Fear. And then through regression analyses, we did see associations between PFOS and Nafion byproduct too with uh, lysozyme activity, which is a function of the innate immune response. So a positive correlation there. And then a positive association with serum PFOS and AST activity, which is an indicator of immune or a liver function, I'm sorry. And then we did determine that PFAS detected in the striped bass do bioaccumulate. So we compared the levels that we had in the serum to levels in the water at Lock and Dam 1 during about the same time. So for PFOS, while the water had 
now less than three nanograms per liter. This is our fish serum. We're looking at orders of magnitude higher, an average of 500,000 nanograms per liter. Gen X and Napion Bioproduct 2 each also increase in the serum of the fish compared to the surrounding water. Then if we consider bioconcentration, um, for us, we looked for if PFOS, we had more PFOS in the serum of larger fish compared to smaller fish. So this is a common pattern that you might expect from persistent organic pollutants or toxic metals like pesticides, DDT, mercury. This isn't what we see in our striped bass. We have lower concentrations of PFOS in larger fish. Now, the smaller fish have higher concentrations of PFOS in their serum. I've also differentiated here on the figure males and females. So males in blue and females in red. Our larger fish were females. They had uh, the lower PFOS in their serum. And we're investigating a hypothesis that these fish might be offloading PFAS into their eggs or milt. So again, to try to apply this, there is no straight bass reproduction in the Cape Fear. Our spawning stock is in complete collapse. Um, in order to respond to this, a total harvest moratorium was implemented about 12 years ago. Uh, and additional restoration efforts over the last decade have focused on improving passage and habitat, um, such as the Rock Arch Ramp at Lock and Dam 1. And through these restoration efforts, we've also been monitoring for fish passage through them, as well as area of spawning. So while we do have fish spawning there at Lock and Dam 1, we have no evidence of those eggs growing into larvae or juveniles. So these, the egg quality may be impaired by the contaminants of concern, either through offloading or direct um, exposure to contaminated water. So by egg quality, I'm referring to the ability to be fertilized and develop into an embryo. So one end phenotype thing that we might look for to measure egg quality is egg buoyancy. So um, the ability of the egg to remain neutrally buoyant in the water column. And for our Cape Fear fish, they're more buoyant than expected. So I can walk you through this. These eggs need to be neutrally buoyant. If they're too positively buoyant, or have a specific gravity, gravity of one, they float at the surface and they can be preyed on uh, by predators or exposed to uh, harsh UV light. If they're too dense or their specific gravity is too high, they sink to the bottom and can be covered up by sediment or fall into a zone where there's not enough oxygen. The problem is that as the salt concentration in the water increases, it's going to make that egg more buoyant. Right? So denser eggs, with an increase in specific gravity, counteract that salt water to remain neutrally buoyant. So in the figure on the right, we have five rivers going from fresh to salty systems. So the Santee Cooper is a true closed freshwater system, then to the Roanoke, Tar, Noose, and the Cape Fear. And the Santee Cooper and Roanoke eggs both have a specific gravity meant for those freshwater systems. Tar and the noose with that increased salt, they increase their specific gravity of those eggs. And then for the Cape Fear, instead of continuing that pattern of increasing specific gravity, that buoyancy is closer to that of the Santee Cooper or the Roanoke. So these eggs are floating closer to the top. So if you want to hear more about uh, the buoyancy of these eggs and uh, the contributing factors to it, I encourage you Tuesday, Kara Kowalczyk. I was being advised by Dr. Ben Reading and Dr. Jesse Fisher as the one that put these data together. She did an amazing amount of work. I really encourage you to check out uh, her talk on Tuesday. Okay, so. Now we're gonna move on to fish consumption and a few things that we've been able to learn from that. Uh, so uh, first, bring us back a little bit to impacts on humans and why we might be concerned about exposure through fish consumption. Um, and then look at the actual exposure, what we're finding in fish. Because from the scope of our work, what we've seen is that there are people fishing in the river. 
And we know that PFAS can do bad things to humans once they get in their body. Um, so we're trying to translate our wildlife studies into benefits for people living in the Cape Fear. So to remind you, these human health studies suggest that PFAS exposure may do a number of things to the human body, such as that increased risk of thyroid disease, um, increases in blood cholesterol levels, uh, and then uh, especially for women of childbearing age and children, uh, increases um, to the risk of high blood pressure and preeclampsia or lower infant birth weight. However, there are benefits of fish consumption, right? So uh, you can lower your risk of heart attacks and stroke. It's a great source of protein. Uh, we do know that uh, people along the Cape Fear rely on the river for subsistence or as a matter of culture. Um, even good dietary sources of vitamin D um, and, and improvements for your overall health can come from fish consumption. So within there, there has to be a balance of being able to extract these benefits while minimizing your potential risk of exposure. So through incidental collection of five striped bass, we were able to take a sample of their muscle fillet and once again, extract PFAS from there and quantify it. And we found another suite of PFAS in that striped, striped bass fillet. Uh, so six of our different PFAS we found in all five of those samples. But I really wanna direct attention to just those top three, PFNA, PFOA, and PFOS. So the total mean concentration here, we're looking at about 105 or 185 nanograms per gram. These top three uh, um, represent about 50% of that total concentration. And these three are the only ones that currently have any kind of fish consumption value that states are using to generate fish consumption advisories. So we look at just those three and their concentrations that we found here in our striped bass and compare them to those fish consumption values for fish consumption advisories in New Jersey, Michigan, and Minnesota. The fish consumption advisories for Michigan and Minnesota would not issue any kind of advisory based on the concentrations that we saw in the tissue of the striped bass. However, in New Jersey, their PFOA screening value would uh, recommend no more than three meals per year for normal populations and an actual do not eat advisory for sensitive populations such as women and children. And then based on PFOS, they would recommend no more than four meals per month. Uh, I will just reiterate that uh, because of that moratorium, uh, it is illegal to keep and eat striped bass out of the Cape Fear. This is a proof of concept that we're gonna be following up on with other species of concern. So more work coming. Uh, we are gonna be evaluating the impacts of reproduction. We do have samples, uh, ovarian biopsy samples from some of the same striped bass that we took uh, blood from the other year so that we can look and see if there are PFAS being offloaded into those eggs. We're gonna uh, explore the patterns of compartmentalization thanks to Jeff Evans at the Watha Fish Hatchery. For WRC, we were able to sacrifice a handful of those phase two fingerlings be able to look at which organs PFAS might be loading into. We still need to work on biomagnification, so those three different levels of accumulation in uh, the aquatic ecosystem. And we do have that ongoing analysis that has determined PFAS distribution in the fillets of catfish, American shad, and sunfish that we're working on understanding. And we still wanna look at river-specific differences between the exposure and biomarkers of health among striped bass populations throughout the coast of North Carolina. Because um, in reality, what we really want to be able to get to are those phase two fingerlings coming out of the hatchery and growing into that mama fish like we saw on the Roanoke. So very quickly, we do have very high levels of PFAS present in our aquatic predators that are associated with the Cape Fear. And most of that is PFOS. Right? So that exposure is associated with biomarkers of effects on the liver and immune function in both of the species that we've evaluated so far. And that exposure and the effects mirror known toxic impacts on other animals as well as on humans. Um, so again, I encourage you to uh, keep up with us. Um, check out our website. Let us know if you have any questions. Hopefully we can get out um, there a little bit more here soon.
So uh, with that, I think I'm going to kick it back over to Dana. We're going to see if there are any questions, but I really appreciate you all being here on Saturday morning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. I'm going to unmute people and I don't know what something funky happened and, and in the middle of the, the presentation, it started requiring a password. Oh, shoot. For people. So I've been, I, I, I think it was, it may have been because we hit record. It's just, you know, yeah. learning Zoom. Yeah, that was an unfortunate um, adjustment to Zoom that they had to make after a uh, photo bomb or a uh, Zoom bombing started to some of the classes and other things. Uh, uh, yeah, and I was wondering if it, did it happen to other people when they joined today? Did they require you a password? Because it didn't. I had my settings still because I, well, I saw that Scott and it was still toggled to no password required. But anyway, we have a password now. Um, I went and found it. It, it toggled on. Um, and so I know we've just got Drake joined us on Zoom. He was on the Facebook. Drake, it's good to see you. Um, I'm going to, you guys have the power to unmute yourselves right. if you have a question. So please feel free. It looks like Larry has a question. Yes. Larry has a question. Yes, um, a couple, but uh, I'll start off with what I think might be the more important one. Um, I, I recall that you were finding various PFAS compounds in the hatchery fish up at Aurora. And uh, one of the things that we've learned about uh, what's gone on at Fayetteville Works, Chemwars and DuPont, I don't mind naming them, uh, is that there were significant air emissions of some number of PFAS compounds, uh, including Gen X, uh, but including some number of others. Um, and I want to zero in on one of those, um, PFOA. Uh, PFOA was the subject of the movie Dark Waters and Rob Billot's work uh, against DuPont uh, with regard to the Parkersburg, West Virginia uh, PFAS plant. They were making PFOA there. And, Big long story. DuPont um, began producing PFOA at Fayetteville Works in the early 2000s. And in 2006, DuPont and the other PFAS manufacturers made a deal with EPA to phase out production of PFOA. And so uh, DuPont stopped making PFOA as a commercial product in 2013. However, PFOA was being released as a byproduct right up until Chemwars installed thermal oxidizer equipment. Uh, I've seen their 2017 air emissions report and what happens is uh, they've been releasing some number of compounds. In the case of PFOA, it wasn't PFOA directly, it was perfluorooctanoyl fluoride, mm -hmm. which reacts with water to form perfluorooctanoic acid, PFOA. So they've been putting that stuff out in the air since they stopped producing the stuff commercially and probably before, of course. So it's not surprising to find PFOA contamination downwind of Chemwars and DuPont Fayetteville Works uh, all the way out to Aurora. I mean, they are downwind. Um, and so, and, and there's a long list of other compounds that they were emitting from uh, the plant in the air. Gen X was one of them, um, a tremendous amount of that, uh, but a long list of other compounds. Um, I believe that uh, Detlef Kanapi and Mark Streiner have seen those air emission reports. I sent them to them. They're really, really, really technical and you gotta wade through them and figure out what's what. And they didn't make it easy when they wrote these reports. Uh, they've got some errors and some uh, different names and crap like that. But uh, there was a lot of stuff being put out, not just into the water, but into the air. So the whole air shed around them has been contaminated. And that goes to food supply. It goes to waters that are not hydrologically connected to the Cape Fear River and so on. So it might be very interesting to match up the PFAS compounds you were finding at Aurora with the stuff that's coming out of the stacks and see if that is a good match. Right. 
Um, yeah, either between that, I mean, we do have open air ponds or, you yeah. know, these are used in so many different consumer products, the, the lining of the tanks, the lining mm -hmm. of the hoses going to it, um, yep. The yep. feed bags. Yep. Yeah. And we, we a lot did, of sources. Yeah. We did find very, very low levels, you know, at Aurora. So it's, yeah. Right. It, 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 yeah. All of these different. Sources. Right. That, that does kind of fit, uh, an air emission source. Uh, mm -hmm. at that distance. Um, the, the PFOS, of course, PFOS, mm -hmm. is very widely distributed. Boy, they've been using that in firefighting foams all over the place, so it's not surprising to find a lot of that. Right. So. Yeah, if you don't mind, um, looks like Dr. Belcher just asked if you could uh, share those admission reports with us. Sure, will do. Thanks. You're going to hate them. <laughs> a couple of, uh, they're, they're, they're a couple of hundred pages long, each one, and what I'm doing is going through and making notes uh, page by page. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish doing that and send the annotated notes up to you along with the reports. Um, they're, they're horrendous. Yeah, I'd appreciate it. I, I know what yeah. I'm getting into, Larry. Unfortunately, I've looked at uh, uh, many of these things for other compounds too. So. Yeah, yeah, it's awful. It's an adventure. Yeah, and, and it doesn't help that they screwed up some of the stuff they put in there. When you read them carefully, it, it turns out they made a lot of mistakes. Uh, they call the same compound by different names from different processes. Mm -hmm. And so you've really got to do the detective work and figuring out what the hell are they trying to tell us here? Um, and it goes back to the division of air quality, which um, let's just say didn't exactly protect the citizens of North Carolina. And I don't mind saying that out loud in public. Mm -hmm hell with those guys. <laughs> nice. um, Maddie, did you see the question? It looks like Kemp Burdett's on, Riverkeeper. Good morning, Kemp. Go in for the Q&A. Um, Maddie, there's a question in the Zoom chat for you from Bevan. I'll go yeah. ahead and read it. She says, Maddie, I'm really interested in the thrombocytopenia. <laughs> How does that sound? Data <laughs> on gators. Given the unusual unhealed lesions, do you think it is caused in part by reduced dotting due to low platelets? Have you considered doing follow-up work to more specifically investigate the impacts on the complement system, which is intrinsically linked to both immune, hermostatic, and inflammatory processes, at least in mammals? I sound so smart. Sorry, I meant to say clotting, not dotting. <laughs> I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, absolutely. Um, so we're, we've got a, um, oh, I think it's actually on my shelf in here, but I have a, a thing to be able to actually um, do a clotting assay in the field with those alligators. So we'll be able to grab those data as well. Well, cool. that's like, I'm super interested in that because some of the data that you showed is quite similar to things that we've observed in our Gen X exposed mice, especially with regards to the clinical chemistry profiles. There are some things that are a bit different, in fact, in the opposite direction. So um, assuming that some of these are interspecies differences, some of these are known to be interspecies differences between humans and mice with regards to some of our readouts. So I'd be very curious to read across uh, phyla into how that uh, links up with what you've seen in the gators. We'd be very interested in that too, Bevan, um, just yeah. given that some of the, the alligator work, right, we're working with pretty long-lived species. So mm -hmm. we did some predicted age modeling with these guys and are showing, you know, animals probably as old as between 40 to 50 years old. Um, so yeah, definitely very interested in following up with you and Sue. Yeah, for sure. Maddie, this is Tom Beard in Michigan. Um. <laughs> I don't know how to send a chat message, I guess, so I'll just say it out loud. Uh, would you be willing to share your um, PowerPoint? I'd like to send it to a couple of activists and some biologists in Michigan to take a look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we can um, definitely chat about the best way to, to do that data sharing uh, between you and I and Dr. Belcher. Um, but I do also know that this talk has been recorded, so um, that'll be posted for Kate to watch too. Excellent. Slide number six had had all those blue dots all over Michigan. Oh my oh, yeah. God. Oh yeah. 
that Michigan's so, done a, a really good job of trying to, to be really comprehensive on their exposure profile. So. Hey, I'm just a fly fisherman. I'm not up there with your uh, guys, but we've got two military bases one at the upstream and one of the one at the downstream ends of the Osabo River, which is sort of the center of fly fishing for the at least east of the Mississippi in our region, and and uh, we've got it all over the place in Michigan. It's uh, pretty crazy stuff, crazy world. Something's going to kill us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to. I have to sign off. Thank you very much. This was very informative and excellent work. Thank you. Hi, Tom. I just want to tell you real quick. If the recorded um, talk doesn't work for you, um, just send me an email, and I can get you a, a copy of the slides and things. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Talk to you all later. Bye bye. Good morning, Tom. Thanks. <clears throat> Um, hey, buddy, it's Drake. I have three questions. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the first two are kind of linked. So do you have any ideas as to why we can detect Gen X in fish serum, but we haven't detected Gen X in human serum? Um, that's a good question. Um, I really wonder if it's a function of um, one of testing, right? So expect a, a lot of the folks, even in the, the human exposure study, have changed their behavior after the news broke um, and before we even collect the samples, whereas the fish are constantly being exposed to what's in the water. So I think that that's probably one of the leading reasons for it. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Plus, it could be like a, yeah, a difference in... Have another thought there too. Were the detection yeah. limits the same? No, our detection limits aren't the same. Yes. Yeah, so if you take our mean level, and Drake, I don't know which which um, which studies you're talking about about can't detect it in humans. I get. I'm presuming the um, the um, the Gen X exposure study from NC State. Um, yeah. yeah so that first one. So it's really important to look. Our our technique was a little bit different, and okay. our mean for Gen X where we can have detection is about where um, the cutoff limit uh, for that study was. So we're able to de call detects um, at a lower concentration than that study did. Yeah. So they're not really comparable of a yes and no right, answer. Right. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I, I can point out um, just one thing, and I'm definitely not a scientist, but we have been working with uh, um, NC State on that Gen X exposure study. And, the samples weren't taken as maddie mentioned you know um habits changed but also the um facility was required to cut off their discharge with uh with i think it was about four months before the um water was sampled and the blood in the urine was taken mm -hmm. um right. and since we know that gen x is a little bit faster in terms of moving out of the body right. that may have had an effect as well uh, that makes sense too that makes sense um, so uh, kind of along those lines, why do you think we can see PFBS in your control populations, but not in the Cape Fear River population? We're still figuring that one out too. I think there's, there's okay. uh, yeah, might be a difference there um, in the binding as well as, you know, uh, if, if there's um, more PFBS used in the, the products, you know, within that. Yeah, that makes sense. With the tanks or the tubing or something like that. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Or if, or if they have carpet somewhere in the building. <laughs> in <their scotch laughs> Not necessarily carpet, but yeah. yeah. The, the um, definitely I would expect. And then my last question, um, have you thought about testing the question of egg quality in a lab strain of freshwater fish, like a zebra fish or uh, something like that? Not to, not to push the zebra fish on you even more, but. <laughs> Yeah, definitely an option. Um, our plan right now, because we have access to that aquaculture field site where they're spawning fish there, is to do it directly with striped bass eggs. Um, so once we can get out to that facility, we're going to do that um, exposure with them. And I'll, gotcha. I'll bring in too here, this is a really important question because that, um, you know, most models do not have the important buoyancy characteristics that Maddie taught, uh, talked about. So the hypothesis specifically that she's looking at is really important for striped bass and other species that require 
that grated buoyancy eggs. And unfortunately, zebrafish, they lay them on the bottom, they do their thing. Um, so all the designed models of the fish are, are a little bit different than some of the questions that we're asking. But for typical embryology and other sorts of things, uh, zebrafish and other fish would be perfectly appropriate and, are, it, and as you know, are being used quite a bit. Well, thanks, Jake. Thanks, y'all. Any other questions? I had a question. Um, I don't. I'm not exactly sure how to word it, though. I'm no scientist. That's okay. But, um, so you talked about um, biomagnification and bioaccumulation in the gators. Mm -hmm. um, is are you using like biomagnification? Is is that able to be used on, or is that have you seen any data supporting that for striped bass, I guess? That's about yeah, so, so specifically when we're, we're trying to differentiate between these vocab words, right? So biomagnification can, can be used for any taxa. Um, the, the, the real thing that we wanna focus on is that we have at least three trophic levels to be right. able to describe that. So yeah, we could look at biomagnification uh, in any of our fish, as long as we can actually identify three trophic levels leading up to that. And you can with the striped bass? Yeah, eventually. Yes, there are lower trophic levels. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. I need more fish. <laughs> well, and Hannah, that's what you're asking about is part of new uh, NC State's new Superfund project. So we have a, we're partners with um, David Buckwalter and uh, Antonio Planchert to specifically look at that going from the paraphyton all the way up through mayflies into the different fishes. So we have a new specific project to look specifically at that in a lot more detail. Oh, nice. Yeah, good question. Hi, this is Rich Campbell. Hey, Rich. Hi, um, as far as our drinking water goes, does like a regular carbon filter remove these chemicals? So most of that work has been done by um, Dr. Detlef Kanapi. Um, he found that while there, there is some decrease in certain PFAS with a carbon filtration system, um, there's a lot more uh, upkeep that you have to do on them to make sure that the filter doesn't get, for lack of a better term, clogged with them right. and start leaching them off. Uh, so what he found was that under, under the sink RO filters are the most effective right. A long-term right. solution for point-of-use drinking water. What are they called again? R O. R O reverse osmosis. Okay. Oh, and I just had an observation. Well, I was up at Lock and Dam uh, number one on Thursday, and I did catch two striped bass. Um, oh, one cool. was one was about fourteen inches. The other one. It was probably about 18 inches and it did have a fat belly to it. So it might have had some eggs in it. Beautiful. Hey, that, that was about mm, two o'clock in the afternoon. I think the tide was dropping cool. until about three and about to come up. And there was quite a few shad being caught. I caught yeah. four shad and lost another one. Yeah, so. the shad are definitely running hard right now. Uh oh. Yeah, good to hear you. And, and yeah, we've heard from a couple of other anglers that, you know, the, that there are stripers there. So, um, you know, it, hopefully at least looking up, at least, you know, working its way back from Hurricane Florence impacts. Yeah, they look fair. The smaller one looked very healthy. The, the fat, longer one seemed to have a little lesion on it, but it could have just been from a rock or something, you know. Um, looks like we've got a uh, question from uh, Dr. Telez. She's down in Belize. Hi, Marissa. Um, she asks if a necropsy has been conducted on any alligators to look at organs or sampling of organs to analyze PFAS. Not yet. Um, you know, fortunately, our uh, uh, mortality rate through this study has been low enough that we haven't been able to do that. <laughs> um, but I think uh, certainly if there, if there was incidental, uh, you know, mortality observed somewhere that, that we were able to get a hold of, then we, we at least have the methods that we would be able to do that. Yeah, I'd like to learn more about that and what 
like if we have a dead alligator reported to us, um, what we could be um, doing in terms of getting a necropsy, what uh, organs we'd want to collect to send off to Squidus, or if we'd want to get those to you all to have them uh, tested for these sorts of things. Yeah. I'd also yeah. encourage, how often are you coming across these alligators with, um, with lesions and things? Is that just we, like a couple of times or? I, I specifically remember at least three um, at Greenfield Lake that we've noticed, you know, significant unhealed lesions. So overall in the study, there's probably been about seven to eight. Um, we've only seen them in Cape Fear River associated animals. Um, we haven't observed any of these at Lake Wakama other than one that had a gunshot wound. I would also in those situations strongly suggest if you guys have the capability um, or, you know, if we could get some samples to have them sent off in those situations, if we could have those tested for lead toxicity. Um, I'll give you an example. A couple years ago, um, I went and did a necropsy on an animal in uh, Duplin County that had, it was a, a large male that had died and it had been, prior to that, it had really unusual um, fungal growth on its eyes and things. And when I did the necropsy, it was very apparent that it was having, it had a um, really bad case of pneumonia and things. And uh, we sent all that to Squidus and they tested the levels of lead in the liver and it came back uh, over eight parts per million, um, which there are no established levels of lead toxicity in alligators, but that's, that's pretty high. Um, there's one paper that came out um, that was published that suggested that these animals in a, uh, at a farm were expected to have leg toxicity and those uh, reported levels were three and four parts per million. So eight, eight is pretty high. And I would think you'd also maybe want to rule out some of these other um, things like that that could be causing some uh, immunosuppression as right. well. Yeah, especially with the, oh, sorry, I'd love Dr. Belcher to jump in here. No, I was going to say, Alicia, it's really easy for us. If you guys, you know, do have dead animals, uh, taking a few grams of liver and storing that frozen and getting that to us is what we can really start to then work up those samples. Um, and those are some things that, you know, we haven't been able to do since, you know, we're not harming the animals and just don't have that opportunity, but that would be a great opportunity for us to collaborate more, would be to just right. look over samples and that would- Yeah, if we could come up with um, some kind of uh, procedural document for, you know, if you come across an alligator that's suspected to have some kind of weird thing going on, these are the things that you'd want to collect and how you'd want to store them and that sort of thing. That would be super helpful. Absolutely, especially for, you know, any wildlife officers that maybe have like nuisance catching or anything like that. Um, and onto your point about lead in the system, we are definitely um, kind of following up with other or both organic contaminants as well as heavy metals and trying to understand really the um, comprehensive view of what's going on in the system. Because I think a, a multi-hit hypothesis is what we're starting to work for. So, you know, these things are, might be influencing the immune system, but how are heavy metals and other things also working in tandem, as well as like, say, harmful algal blooms to cause this overall health effect? Yeah, that's scary too. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll introduce you. This is um, Alicia Davis. She's with the Wildlife Resources Commission. She's our local alligator biologist pro. So really been thankful for your collaboration on this too. Um, looks like a question from Hannah. Um, what is the significance of the helmet cells pointed out in the gator blood smear? So these, these helmet cells, um, let me see if I can do it and then Therese is going to jump in. Uh, but these can be caused, um, a couple of different causes for helmet cells, but the most common, you know, you're looking at some kind of physical disruption to that red blood cell, right? So yeah, now it's Therese's turn. So um, in looking through hematology analysis, we also um, understand that these cells are more present in autoimmune conditions, and we're currently working on that right now. Um, so it's a, it's a work in progress, but still, we've only seen presence of these in Cape Fear River-associated animals. 
Yeah, and it, it's okay. It's not so. Our working hypothesis is, um, and we're we're bringing the data together in a publication that we're working on right now, is that there may be an increased prevalence of markers related to autoimmunity. Um, this is something that's that's very new, has never been observed in reptiles. So we're having to go back to some really basic pathology and build an evidence base uh, to support this. And this um, could really be related to some of the human uh, impacts that have seen with um, the, the PFOLIS uh, exposure from the, from the C8 study. One of the strong links that they had with PFOLIS the PFOA exposure was a link to interstitial cystitis, or not interstitial cystitis, um, colitis. Um, and um, so the, we're, we're starting to build an evidence base just through our observation that we was completely unexpected to us that there may be evidence um, of some changes in autoimmunity in these animals. So. Anybody else have questions for any of the, it seems like we have, I'm kind of like super excited about this conversation because I'm like a nerd, but also because um, I think that in this opportunity of doing this remote has kind of brought together some folks from all over that wouldn't have made it to our office. <laughs> um, so I'm really glad that you guys are all on and that there's this amazing back and forth between so many scientists and that you've had this opportunity to collaborate here and sort of share your knowledge. I don't really understand much of it, but that's okay. <laughs> um, You're doing so, great, Dana. Thanks. I'm, I'm really excited um, that, that y'all have come. Does anybody have any other questions? And like Maddie said, we, do, we did record this um, meeting and I am in the process of putting every first Saturday seminar from January 2020 up on the website. Um, it's a work in progress, but this session was recorded here as well as on Facebook Live. Um, so we'll have the opportunity to uh, to watch it again every day of the, of the of the coronavirus pandemic if we want. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so if if there aren't any more questions, um, I'll 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 say goodbye and thank you so much. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Maddie. I do have a quick question for the oh, group? Um, it's just, a, it's not about this topic. It's just, I um, wanted to see if it would be all right if I took a, a photo of our chat, like um, of my screen. <laughs> so I want to make sure that was okay with everybody to put on Twitter to like show how successful this went. <laughs> we have some infections sure. on our Twitter. I'm so, glad, I'm so glad you're thinking like that. <laughs> so yeah, if anybody wants to not be we on can all, We know. can all wave. There you yeah. go. Good idea, let's wave. <laughs> Let me see here. Let me go. There you go. Jeannie, where are you? <laughs> Hold on, there's a glare. One second. <laughs> there she is. Oh, there we go. There's a glare. Hey, Jeannie. <laughs> okay, we can stop waving. You got it. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, thank, you. thank you so much, Maddie. And hey, thank you all. Yeah, and happy birthday, Maddie. Happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Maddie. Maddie. Bye. Take it easy, y'all. Be safe. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. Great presentation. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Maddie. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. Happy birthday, Maddie. Bye, Marsha. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye, <laughs> Off to breakfast. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Hi, Esther. All right. Good to see, see you. I'm glad you got on. Good to see you, see you too. This was I saw great. That you. I saw Thank that you, you Dana. Wonderful. Um, Your sure hair is so different. Oh, well, it's just so bad. <laughs> Oh, there it is! <laughs> it's like magic. <laughs> well, I hope you guys enjoy the day. We've got some sunshine today. We'll this is really great. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 See you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>